<laughs> so thank you for everybody uh, coming to the uh, today's uh, privacy talks. I'm uh, very honored to uh, invite the great speakers, uh, Debbie uh, from the United States. Uh, she has uh, many experiences in, in uh, privacy space, and it's a uh, very honor to have uh, conversations at this moment. Thank you, Debbie, for coming uh, today's. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here and happy to talk with you and your audience. Yeah, she's also the uh, organized the podcast or channels to distribute the uh, uh, privacy information. So uh, please uh, check uh, what she's doing. I will put this some um, link. Uh, she's efforts. That's uh, very awesome as well. So let me start uh, introduction of her. Uh, Debbie is the founder, CEO, and chief data privacy officer of Debbie Reynolds Consulting LLC. Uh, Debbie Reynolds, the data diva, is a world renowned technologist, thought reader, and advisor to multinational corporations for handling global data privacy, cyber data breach response, and complex functional data driven projects. Ms. Reynolds, is an internationally published author, highly sought speaker, and top media presence about global data privacy, data protection, and emerging technology issues. Ms. Reynolds has also been recognized as a technology visionary and as a top leader in data privacy industry worldwide. So Debbie, thank you for having um, talk these times. Well, thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, I would like to start uh, the uh, today's interview with you. Uh, first of all, uh, let me start about the activities. So you are running your consulting services for the enterprise, and also you do uh, many uh, publications such as the podcast or blogs or many things related to the privacy updates that is a very knowledgeable force. So how, how do you work with the enterprises such as the client as a privacy experts? Sure, that's an excellent question. Uh, so I do a couple of different things. Some things are very unique, maybe that a lot of other people don't do. So my background, I'm a technologist um, who's always been very interested in privacy. So I got my initial interest in privacy really was um, a book I read in 1997 called The Right to Privacy. It was a book that my mother had and she was very fascinated by that issue. And so I read the book and it just captured my attention. So over the years, as technology continued to grow and get more complex, I've kept track of how privacy has evolved over the years. And as my technology career progressed as I'm working with multinational corporations, helping them do data moves around the world, uh, it just sort of came together. So I, you know, my advisory, I work with companies that have any type of multinational or even national concern because of the U.S. Uh, complex data privacy landscape. Uh, but I uh, also work with many companies trying to be more proactive about things like privacy by design. So I'm working on standards, for example, um, for companies that develop virtual reality and augmented reality, mixed reality types of applications. So the, the goal is to try to draft things that possibly legislators would use uh, to be able to create laws and also be able to help people who are developing these technologies to do it in a way that respects privacy. But we also want our businesses to be able to make money. So we want to have both of those things. Thank you. I assume that uh, a lot of things is coming, in, in particular the privacy regulation, uh, even not in, only for in the US market, but as well as happens in, in Europe. Uh, so what, what the companies uh, has to take uh, first step to uh, prepare for the uh, privacy and data protections? Yeah, I think the best first step 
well, maybe two steps. The best two steps that I think that companies should take is uh, the first would be determining the data that they have and try to connect it to a purpose. So making sure that they understand why they have data and be able to, to be able to justify why they have it so they can use it in their business. And then the other thing that I always recommend, recommend people do is things like data minimization. So uh, lots of companies have data, legacy data that has been around for a really long time, things that may not be used right now. So I highly recommend that companies go through their data stores and look for things that have not been used for a really long time that they can't figure out what a business purpose is and be able to get rid of that stuff because that that data is often low value to a business but it's also high risk if it gets breached so those are two basic things that i think any company can do i see I think there are a lot of companies still collecting many data, even this has not been uh, updated since they firstly collected those uh, uh, properties from the data subject. That is the meaningful to just uh, collecting the data, just uh, storing the data. I, I think this is the upheaval uh, for the data industries to reconsider why this data is really important for the business. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, I think there's a Western way that people talk about data. I don't know, I'm sure you've heard of this. Uh, people say that data is a new gold. Um, and I don't really agree with that. I think that insights from data is probably the most valuable thing. So just hoarding data, if you hoard data and you don't have a purpose for it, it can, not only is it not, valuable is actually a risk uh, to have it. So I think we need to really be more conscious about or more purposeful in how we collect data uh, and how we store it and retain it and really ask those questions. Because a lot of times when data is being collected, you just collect it and no one thinks about it. So they don't think about deleting things. They don't think about you know being old and I'm not uh, being able to get any use out of it. But as we're seeing so many data breaches that are happening around the world, a lot of companies are having you know bad financial problems because they may get into regulatory trouble for having so much data and not being able to protect it. So the more data that you have, the more data you have to protect. Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe the data industry has been the changed since uh, they gonna started. That just uh, it was uh, so expensive to store the data at the beginning, but the gradually the uh, technology is improving in these situations to uh, to to take uh, more data from the users. I think it's not so good. We have to be considered back to the normal. <laughs> it's a very uh, natural for the data business. So I want to explore with you about the privacy industry so far. Uh, you are getting into this uh, field uh, for a long time. And uh, what is the dynamic change of this industry uh, since you have started the work in on this space? That's a great question. Let's see. The changes in the industry, you know, I've had, because I've had a privacy interest for decades, you know, I felt very lonely that you know very few people wanted to talk about it or really thinking about it so i was really excited when i started to see the regulations come out and be more you know privacy as you know privacy regulations are not new i think the new thing over the last few years has been privacy regulations that have very high cost fines for organizations that can't protect data so that has created this new industry where companies are trying to find a way to still do business, uh, comply with privacy regulations and not, you know, get out of business or, or have to absorb these really high fines. So I think 
the dynamic change has been is more people, obviously, in the privacy, you know, privacy is an industry now, it wasn't before. So it's a kind of its own industry. And then because there are so many privacy regulations and then the data, the data is very different. So, you know, the cloud has changed, the internet and the cloud has changed privacy significantly where we were thinking about data in jurisdictional ways. So now data, data rights, can go beyond jurisdiction. So that's very different. And I think, especially people who think about privacy from a legal perspective, that's something I think they have had a trouble grappling with because law is very much about jurisdiction. So having things that are flowing out of jurisdictions and managing that, I think is kind of a new, new thing. I, I see. Uh, in the United States, the uh, data uh, business is uh, direct to the um, the public welfare, such as the uh, like the Snowden issues in uh, 2013, then also the Cambridge Analytica is in 2016. So how, how does it impact to the uh, U.S. Uh, citizens uh, regarding uh, those kind of the uh, uh, enormous incidents for the influences that any uh, behaviors or the actions or any of the uh, indication for that? I think that those uh, incidents have created a lot more awareness from individuals about their data and how it's being handled. So I think a lot of people, in my experience, a lot of people in the U.S. have assumed for many years that they have more privacy rights than they have. Uh, you know, some people think about, you know, they think about, you know, freedom of speech and different things like that. And they kind of try to equate that with privacy, but it really isn't spelled out that way in our constitution. Um, you know, we have something like uh, in the fourth amendment of the constitution, something against, you know, unreasonable search and seizure, but it doesn't really go into the way privacy or the way data is handled today uh, in situations that aren't related to law enforcement. So I think that those those instances really help to bring more awareness to individuals. And now we're, I think we're seeing more people as they see they're using more data, right? There are more people with phones on the internet, you know, the internet and a lot of things have become so, so vital now, especially because of COVID. So people, especially COVID, I think COVID has really brought those issues, you know, very close to individuals where they're thinking very much, you know, how about how they share data and how their data is protected. I see. Thank you. Yeah, that is a very interesting. Uh, we have a different perceptions from Japan because the it was a direct to the United States, uh, the uh, new um, elections of the presidencies. Uh, however, the, from the Japanese perspective, this is a um, pretty far distance. Uh, what's happened going on? So that's a <laughs> very uh, different uh, conceptions of the privacy. But the, we are uniquely uh, ongoing at this privacy uh, rising awareness since the COVID happens. A lot of People is worried about the privacy, the people is worried about the impact when disclosing the data. So this is the upcoming uh, in the worldwide. Uh, so then my next question is about the, uh, like the, the, the data subject rights, uh, which has been enacted the underlying of the GDPL. Uh, this has been started the almost uh, uh, three years ago. That was a very strict regulation, not only for the European companies, but also many American uh, companies or business as well. So what would the companies uh, need to be paying attention to the uh, light of the data subject uh, in terms of the data protection regulations? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so as a result of GDPR and all the other locations around the world that are passing privacy laws, one of the major uh, facets or one of the major things that are in almost all of these privacy laws is a, a 
transparency. So transparency meaning that when companies use the data of individuals, they need to be transparent with them. So what I like to say with companies is that data belongs to the individual and then the individual shares the data with the company for them to provide a service, right? So when they're doing that, companies that have individual data should think that think of themselves as a data steward. So they the data doesn't belong to them, it belongs to someone else and they need to handle it accordingly. So I like to say it's almost like you give your data to a bank and then when you give your data to a bank, you expect them to give you information about your, your money, right? So if, for example, you put money in the bank, you know, your bank said that I can't tell you what, what, how much money you have in the bank, you'd be very upset. So if you think about data in the same way, individuals really should have transparency into how their data is being handled. And I think that the data subject access request, which is something, a feature that was in the GDPR that came out many years ago, we're seeing many other uh, privacy regulations that are either new or updated, uh, bringing in that language about having some avenue by which uh, an individual can ask for information about how their data is being handled. I see. I assume that in California has been a started the CCPA, uh, but it's uh, it's uh, uh, more focused on the opt out uh, for the requirements of the companies. But the opt out is a little bit uh, obscure for the uh, people who wants to uh, insist of the their own uh, data rights. Uh, so in these cases, the how do you think about the in California's or other uh, jurisdiction in the United States to move to the opt-in based or any other uh, requirements that will be coming in uh, in in next decades? Well, that's really interesting. So when I think of Europe and some other places, they are very strongly uh, into opting in as opposed to opting out. In the U.S., we've been very we've been more of a notice country where you don't have to opt in or out you just they just say you know we're going to use your data and do xyz you know we're going to use your data and then we we have informed you and that's kind of all the, the company has to do but now we're seeing with laws of ccpa where they're they are saying that you have opt out and there are a couple of other laws that have, have come into play since ccpa has been um enacted they have portions that uh, require opt-ins, mostly around very sensitive personal data, like health, stuff like that. But one really big development that's happened, and this is happening all over the world now because of Apple, um, Apple and their iOS 14.5 update uh, is changing the way marketers or third parties get data from individuals. So they're requiring for third parties if they want to have more detailed information about an individual that they have to, the individual has to opt in. And that, has, that I think is going to have a huge impact around the world because obviously Apple is a very big com company. They have so many customers around the world. And if they're making those types of changes, I think it's going to be reflected possibly down the line in laws in a way you know, just the way marketing data is handled or the way third-party data is handled. I see. Yeah, since the Apple has been started the more transparent uh, to use in a uh, customer data for any specific purposes, I think we're going to start to work on the privacy policy development, which has been uh, just a communication with the customers. Uh, so far that we have a lot of the dark patterns, it's just uh, uh, like uh, strictly a uh, consent. It's not been uh, like a free understanding of the customer what to be written on the privacy policies is that very big issues. So how, how do you envision the, the future privacy policy uh, for the making a free consent or any 
other requirements for making a privacy policies? Well, I think, you know, the, the step that Apple took is very important. And also Google is taking a similar step in a way. So definitely not the same way. But what I'm seeing is that many of these privacy laws have responsibilities for first party data holders, you know, so like, let's say you do business with a bank. So they're putting responsibilities on the bank, obviously, to say you need to protect someone's data a certain way. But then these privacy laws are also saying you need to be responsible if you have to transfer the data to a third party. So let's say a bank has to use the ATM. So a company that uses the ATM machine, a money machine that you take money out of, you know, in order for the bank to use this ATM machine, uh, for example, they may have to coordinate with a different company. So if they're doing that, they're putting restrictions or ob more obligations on the third party about the data that they're sharing. So what I think is gonna happen is that they're uh, in order to limit the risk of giving data to third parties, these companies are gonna start to be more strict, I think, in how they share data with third parties or they'll do something like Apple has done with just saying, if you want, you know, we can give you general data or, you know, just anonymized in some way. But if you want more data, you have to directly get the consent of the individual. So I think that's gonna be something that will, you know, put, be put in place possibly with other companies that handle data. And also I think other places that are looking at what, what Apple and some of these other companies are doing with data, I think they'll probably start to put that into uh, data privacy laws. Thank you. Yeah, in terms of the third parties, uh, that is the uh, um, very key parts of the uh, dialogues here as well in Japan and how we can share the data, uh, whether you could make uh, free consent from the customers, then the customer's understandings of the intentions to use this data, that is the uh, key part of the contract with the customers. Um, so in, in terms of the third party cookies or those data is also the one of the dialogue this moment. Uh, I found the, uh, your activities, the privacy risk index. Uh, this is a very interesting challenge in the, the, the for uh, those kind of the, uh, like the, the cookies actions. So uh, how do you work with this one then? Well, what is about the privacy risk index? Sure. So the Privacy Risk Index is something created by a company out of the UK uh, called Privacy and Cookies. And they, over the years, have been building websites for you know, governments or health uh, organizations. So they have to be pretty strict about how data is handled in websites, especially the, the, depending on the types of data that you're getting. And what they were seeing as these websites were being built, you know, these web, wh whether it be an off the shelf software to help build websites or people doing websites themselves, or, you know, a lot of websites that have third party uh, applications built into them to, to let them do different functions. And what they were seeing is that some of these websites that are being built are passively, sometimes passively or actively collecting more data than maybe individuals know about. So the purpose of the index is to really bring awareness to how websites are using people's data and just to give individuals, you know, to give individuals more visibility into how certain websites handle their data. And then also for people who are privacy professionals, you can use it for any website. So let's say you're working with a company, you're trying to evaluate you know, their privacy issues or risks. Uh, you can type in your the website of any place and they'll be able to show you some high level stuff about you know, the types of cookies that are being used, whether it's third party cookies, whether it's uh, putting data into databases and then you know from a privacy professional's point of view that may be something that you may take back to a 
a client and say, well, you know, here's some, some issues that we need to handle within the index. And really the index is, to, is it gets updated every month. So over time, you know, we're hoping that some companies will get better. And, and they've, they've shown that over time where, you know, once they have that awareness and they know where to look, they can, you know, improve their privacy stance. Yeah. So there are a lot of uh, risk-based approach, such as the in European Union has been released, the AI then risk-based uh, requirements uh, under the regulations. Uh, that is uh, very uh, strict for the data business. In terms of the cookies, it's also uh, becoming a more strict uh, to share. Uh, as a even it's 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 not the identifiable it's the the kind of the uh, uh, personal data so there is a, a significance is to administrate the district at this moment uh, so so how do you think the uh, enterprises uh, to take a risk analysis uh, beforehand to start the data business uh, for the data use yeah I think it's really challenging I think the easiest way for companies to really reduce their risk of data handling is to be able to tie their data use to a purpose that is justifiable. So uh, let's say you go to buy a cake from the grocery store and they have a, a card that will give you discounts if you use their card, right? So you you have to agree to say okay i i do want these discounts i'm willing to share my data with this company about my shopping habits or whatever so that would be an example of what would be considered kind of a legal use where you have given your consent they've told you what they're going to do with the data and you're willing to accept that but let's say you know you want to buy bread or some, or a cake from the grocery store and they say they want your credit card, not your credit card, but let's say like a like your personal ID number or something, right? You know, you would think that's not necessary for you to be able to, to give that information over to buy a cake from the grocery store. So uh, companies that are looking to move into this area and to be able to uh, justify uh, why they have data. I think they need to really think it through and ask those questions. Uh, you know, I know that when I'm working with companies, it's like you re-asking the question because a lot of times they put these systems in place and no one ever thought to ask, you know, why do we collect this information? And if we collect it, do you really need it? So Part of it is just going through the exercise, asking what data is collected, why they're collecting it, have them you know, think through, does it tie into a business purpose? If not, then either, either need to stop collecting the data or be able to get a consent from individuals to continue to collect it. Yeah, I think it's a turning point for the data industry so far a lot of the data Brokers exist in the using the personal data without uh, any consent from the uh, users. That is, uh, is illegal for the futures. That is not the fairness for the users. The benefits uh, from the perspective, yeah, that is a uh, the 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 very great futures for the data business. So lastly, I'd like to ask you about the message for the listeners. Uh, mostly is. Uh, watching these interviews, uh, privacy experts, the people who want to join these industries. So could you give us any message for them? Oh, sure. Privacy, I think, is a great industry to get into because privacy is about people. And there are many, many people in the world, right? And then mm. there are many companies that are using data of people. So I think we all have a vested interest, I hope in our own personal privacy. But if, you know, I highly recommend people who are from all types of industries, if they join together their expertise in whatever industry they're in and also develop an interest in privacy, I think it will make them very valuable uh, because I think we need people 
from all different areas, all different professions who have an interest in privacy because it can't just be lawyers, it can't just be technology people, it can't just be project manager people, it has to be almost anybody. So anyone I think who has a interest in privacy, regardless of what industry they're in right now, being able to join their expertise with privacy will make them very unique. Yeah, that's a very awesome message. We are inspired that uh, you've been working for a long time and it's going to be the time to reconsider the, what's your data business, what is the benefit for the user. Uh, privacy is the user. Actually, it's true. Then we're going to start standing up to work for that. So baby, thank you for having the time. It's uh, great to please to have a call with this moment and let's keep enough to work with these industries. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for, for inviting me and I'm very happy to talk to your guests. And this was fantastic. Thank you, great questions. Thank you.